He continues his journey and then stumbles across a bunch of dead baboons. Hmm, it's possible that Ursa could have done this. It's too bad my drones never catch any footage of it. Katai makes it to the waterfall and Cypher asks him to check his supplies again. Food rations half available, flares full, med kit half available, breathing fluid, breathing fluid. Full vials available. Why does his heart keep going up when I ask him about the breathing shit? Why are you not showing me the case? Show it to me now. Okay, so you could have just looked at it when you were suspicious last time and you didn't. Cypher tells him he now needs to abort the mission and come back, despite the computer telling him that there is a possibility of him making it with the amount of vials he has left. Abort mission. Why would you tell him to come back? It's too dangerous to risk you dying. Come back here and we'll both die together for sure. Now it's my turn to have a flashback. Oh shit, it's my sister getting murdered by the- Ugh, I feel so responsible. Hey, wait a minute. So considering Katai survived that whole ordeal, we can reasonably assume that it's because the Ursa couldn't smell him behind that glass bubble. So why weren't people trying to fight the Ursa in skin-tight armor or something? Clearly there's a way you can hide the smell of your own pheromones, so why the fuck weren't they doing that? Who knows, maybe it would have to be super airtight and having a suit that you could move around easily in would be too difficult to manufacture. But that might work if you just wanted to seal off a cockpit to like a tank or something. I'm thinking you could pretty much do that with any sort of war vehicle or aircraft. It's too bad human civilization spent so much money perfecting space travel, because it seems like it really drained the military budget. Yeah, fighting giant creatures with fucking ground troops. I guess the narrative of humanity being on the verge of extinction wouldn't really fit if they weren't so fucking stupid. Well, we just had Will's monologue, so now it's time for Jaden to steal the show. No, Dad. We... I can do it. I, can, I don't need many. I can get across with just two. You need a minimum of three inhalers to make it to the tail. Why are you lying to him? So what, you're like trying to save him now by imposing certain death on the both of you? Did you forget when you said this? You want to die. Today that is fine, but you are not going to kill me. What did you want me to do? She gave me an order. She said no matter what, don't come out of that box. I feel embarrassed for him. Come on, Will, show him how it's done. What do you think you should have done? Because really that is all that matters. What do you think you should have done? Jesus fucking Christ. I think this scene is the best example of just how fucking poorly cast they were. God damn it, it doesn't sound right. Which is crazy because they wrote the roles for themselves, but they're both playing the exact opposite type of character that they should be playing. Here you've got one of the most charismatic actors in Hollywood, playing a completely humorless character that's unable to show any emotion except anger. And here you've got a 14 year old kid whose main concern is how to look cool, playing a character who's supposed to be relatably emotional and affectionate, this movie was fucking destined to fail. Will is so physical, he's a physical actor, and he's, he's very, you know, um, he easily goes from one emotion to the next. In fact, you have to like stop him. He's so easy. He can go from anger to fun to this to that to fear. And Jaden is so protective of his emotions. And he's a very quiet actor. So quiet actors would be like Clint Eastwood, you know, there's certain palettes where they're just very still. With Jaden, you have to continually find the combination to get to his, his emotion. You know, he is a, he's a very unique kid. He, you know, he's uh, very understated and, and uh, you know, he's uh, very delicately e emotional. He's sensitive, so he, ha he really has a hard time with aggressive emotion. You know, you're always the hero. You're always mm -hmm. saving the day, but this time you're kind of stern, mm -hmm. you're a bit mean. Yeah. Yes. You're not. You're not really. You're like a bit of an antihero. Yes, an antihero. How did you go about uh, emotionally connecting with this character? Because there is an interesting element where he is suppressing his mm -hmm. fear within him. I'm curious if you think that uh, in that in, in suppressing his fear, could mm -hmm. that have suppressed his other emotions as well? What um, what I've found with Cipher, and I, I wanted to, to play as the idea that he, in order to suppress his his fear he had to also suppress his ability to love and connect emotionally. Every choice that was made was the worst possible choice. That is, unless you're watching it as a comedy. Oh my god, his pacing is so awkward, it's like they intentionally left space for a laugh track. And you think I'm a coward? <laughs> when I'm like 17, I'll be like, yeah, I've been acting for a decade. You know. <laughs> and someone will slap you. <laughs> It might be me. <laughs> I'm not a coward! 
Guitar! Okay, so now a bird is chasing after him. This fight scene is so riveting and intense, I totally believe that he's getting chased by a giant bird right now and it's not some computer mumbo jumbo. This would probably be the best place in the movie for him to die for comedic effect. I'm not a coward, you're a coward! Ah! Yeah, go through a waterfall. God damn it. I wonder if his thing stopped working because he ran into the bird or if maybe it just wasn't waterproof. Considering how poorly thought out all the other design choices in this universe are, I wouldn't be surprised either way. Bay caught me slipping. Oh shit, what the fuck? This is the fourth time I've passed out this movie. Better watch out cause now some more computer animated danger is heading your way. There's a lot of animals in this movie, especially mm -hmm. you're running from these crazy uh, monkeys that look like aliens and mm -hmm. a, a wolf that looked like you had a really bad day. Yeah. yeah. Now, uh, when any of these animals real uh, or was that all special effects as well and if so what's the animal you enjoyed working with the most mm. No, 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 no. <laughs> oh my god, I'm so scared. The way that this is directed makes it seem like there's totally a giant animal in front of him right now. And not only that, but I'm seriously concerned that he won't make it out of this alive because he's the main character. Main characters die in like 99% of the movies right now. Okay, so based on how that worked, the creature was actually lunging at the spot next to you and not at you. I guess you're lucky that it had no interest in eating you and just really wanted to attack the side of that nest. I thought gravity was supposed to be stronger than what you were used to. So Jaden Smith climbs down the tree and it looks like either the babies conveniently fell in that spot or the mother brought them down from the nest and then put them in that spot in the time that Jaden was climbing down. Either way, it's a very dramatic experience for Jaden. Fuck! 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 Dad. I'm sorry, it's Katad. I think the line is, Dad, I'm sorry, it's Katai. Or even Kata, but not Katad. I'm sorry, it's Katad. You stumbled over your lines and M. Knight said, okay, that's a wrap. Yeah, you know, it's, it's, it's strange. I'm not necessarily, on the first day on set, I'm really excited because I, I prep like crazy. How I deal with my fear is I prep like crazy. So this one I prepped for one year, knew every design, knew every single thing inside and out, you know, knew every single shot, had it all lined up, knew, knew each lens, knew exactly where I was gonna put the camera, everything. You think I'd rehearsed like crazy with Jaden and you know, every single thing. So you, you, I deal with my fear that way. I don't wanna get there and panic, but then it starts to creep in, you know, as, as the unexpected happens. Oh my God, the weather went that way. The camera doesn't really work that way. Jaden did something different. This is not quite what I thought. Uh, the panic starts making you freak out. You go, it's all right, you can deal with change. Well, now he realizes that his thing is fucked. Fucking idiot. Will tries to look for him using the drones, but oh shit, there's his signature detected. He then decides to leave a message for his wife in the ship. This is a message for my wife. I, uh, I have lost contact with our son. End message. That's it? No sorry or anything? I think maybe he had a lot more planned out in his head, but then he got bored and stopped. Under what circumstance was that message necessary at all? Like if a search party somehow comes by and finds Cypher Rage's corpse, would they just listen to it and be like, oh, I guess he doesn't know where Katai is either. So even though Katai is lost and confused, it somehow helps him to draw a map on the inside of the cave. And by a map, I mean just a fucking straight line with points in between. I figured that you would still need to know your own current location for that to be of any use to you, but hey, whatever works. Works. So it looks like the bird is now trying to track him down. Leave me alone! Yeah, yell at it. What the fuck? He takes his last vial of lung fluid and then builds a raft, and then he passes out for the fifth time in the movie. Oh hey, it's my sister in what is clearly a dream sequence. Are you scared? No. I'm tired. Me too. Now you gotta get up. I memorized some of Moby Dick. Oh my god! Why the fuck do they keep reincorporating this? At least take a knee, I can understand. You know, it's supposed to represent being calm and collected, which is also what ghosting is. But what the fuck does Moby Dick have to do with anything, and why do you keep shoving it in our faces? It's an underlying theme about this Moby Dick. I'll try to get to, get yeah, to that. Yeah. Like, why, why did that come into the movie? So that, that there was just the, the, the little hint in the Moby Dick of the wailing. Right, so we, uh, it's representative of another of the way that we were destroying the environment. In Moby Dick, they were whaling so much, they were killing all of the whales and the whales were starting to go mm. um, extinct. Oh. So that was one, you know, one of the- the Okay, okay, the, the environmental the, things. That the idea and the, and the fear concept of Ahab in, in his attack 
of Moby Dick, so we were sort of mirroring that uh, to how the planet uh, reacted against us. So apparently if you've actually read Moby Dick, there is some connection to be made towards the film. And as someone who hasn't read Moby Dick, I'm not about to argue about how loose of a connection that may be. But regardless of whether or not that particular connection was even warranted, do you not think that its delivery should have been just a bit more subtle? Whether or not you've read Moby Dick, you know for a fact that this movie is trying to beat you over the head with a point. But what's the point in even including connections like those if you treat the audience members like they're fucking four years old? The type of person that needs to have something shoved in their face to the degree that this movie thinks is necessary is certainly not the type of person who would look at it and then go, Oh, nature's ambivalence towards man is reflected in the film by showing the planet turning against them, similarly to how Moby Dick reflected those same concepts by showing the ferocity of nature itself. How interesting. So on one hand, you're begging for your film to be analyzed on a deeper level. But on the other hand, you seriously wrote a scene to include a character literally holding up the fucking book in front of the fucking camera. Just in case you don't get it. I'm getting some mixed signals here. Guitar, get up. All that most maddens in torments. Guitar, wake All up. All that stirs up the leaves of things. Wake up, it's time All for you to wake All true in it. Oh my god, stop, stop, stop. Guitar. All that cracks and sinews and cakes in the brain. Ah. Oh no, now I gotta get to another hot spot. Or I could just stop right here and give up. The amount of cold that would make you literally fall over and stop moving is the same amount that would fucking kill you. He just gave up because he got bored. If there's frost growing on your face, your eyes would be fucking frozen too. Trust me, guys. Okay, so now something's dragging him around. I'm awake again after being unconscious for the sixth time. He crawls outside of the hole only to see this. What? <laughs> Thanks. What? The bird saved him? I thought, what What the fuck? Did the bird just love him this whole time and it just captured him to bring it back to his nest so he could raise it as one of their own? Did this bird premeditate you being in this area and dig a hole specially for you so that it could put you inside when you eventually fuck up? Were you even in a hot spot? Cause the bird fucking died. He's dead? Thank you, dead bitch. <laughs> died? He did die. Can we explain why the bird died? I lost my young. I want Jaden Smith to feel that same thing. Fucking apple. I'm gonna keep him alive just so that he can see me die. You know? I, I think it's. I Instead, think. Then I just want to make him feel bad. I think it's just bad directing. Was the secret to surviving at night just digging a little hole the whole time? Did it even dig a hole or did it just cover you with a bunch of leaves? I think that maybe the bird was kind of like covering the spot, kind of. How the fuck do you even write this? Oh my god, it turns out I'm going the right way. Fuck yeah. Gross, there's like toilet paper all over the place. Clean up after yourself, Jaden. Remember, this isn't just the future. This is the organic future. Overindustrialization led to the entire planet becoming inhospitable, so now I guess everything's gotta be made out of cloth. So M. Night Shyamalan obviously showed up what this futuristic 1,000 years in the making Earth looks like. Mm -hmm. What do you kind of imagine that to be in a thousand years, what our Earth is gonna look like? I imagine that. <laughs> Thousand. Very futuristic. He immediately salvages some conveniently located breathing fluid. He digs around and then finds another cutlass. Wait, what the fuck? When did you lose your cutlass? You were just using it to yell at that bird. Okay, you didn't have it on the raft? When did you lose it? Okay, let's see. You have it here. And then in the very next shot. What the fuck? Is there like a deleted scene? Did he just set it on the ground and start walking away? Like this ought to shake things up. Anyway, he's got one now. So that's all that's important, I guess. Oh shit, the Ursa. Meanwhile, it looks like Will Smith's shunt has failed. He has another flashback. I'm sorry, is that your son giving you a fucking cutlass? Is that not a dangerous weapon? How heartfelt. No. What? Oh sweet, a brand new armband thing too. He quickly finds the beacon, but when he tries to activate it, it says there's a signal interference. Since he got a brand new armband, his father's now able to see and hear him. But for some reason, he's unable to receive any audio from his father. Oh, I thought that said herpes for a second. Despite this, Katai is doing the exact same things that his father is telling him to do anyway. Take a knee. Yay, he's independent now and his father's advice is sticking with him even though he can't communicate with him. It is the ionic layer in the atmosphere above your current position. It is causing electrical interference. That is why the beacon is not firing. The peak, you must fire the beacon from the peak of that mountain. Okay, so the beacon can't fire because of the atmosphere above his current position. And you're certain that him going to the top of this volcano mountain would put him above that layer of interference? Because it seems as though the supposed interference is also the excuse they're using as to why Katai can't hear him. And if that's the case, then don't we already know that there would be no interference if he simply just started trekking back? Like you were planning on going back to your dad at some point anyway, right? You have more than enough breathing fluid to be able to make it, so why not just take the beacon with you? Is it not a whole lot riskier to bring it into uncharted and possibly 
incredibly dangerous territory, especially now considering that you know for sure that the Ursa has escaped. I mean, the probability of it being along the path that you just came from is fairly low. I mean, it's possible that it's the atmosphere of the entire fucking planet that's blocking it, and that his brand new armband malfunctioning is just a coincidence. And if that's the case, then yeah, your main concern should probably just be getting to a high point. But didn't you fall down a fucking cliff to get here? And would you not have to get back up to that height to make it back to your dad anyway? Was the edge of the cliff not already taller than the peak of that fucking volcano mountain? It seems as though what you want him to do is highly illogical and irresponsible. I guess it comes with the territory of not being able to feel fear. Why would I ever think about consequences? Unless what he really means to say is, uh, my shunt failed, so you should risk your own life if it means me getting help sooner. Yay, self-preservation at the expense of my own son. Although there's no real way that Katai would have known about his shunt failing, so I guess their newfound ability to telepathically communicate with each other kind of works out. Well, it looks like stupidity runs in the family, because now Jaden also sees it as a brilliant idea. Good boy. Good boy. Good boy. Oh no, clearly the Ursa has been around here, but I'm just gonna keep going this way anyway, because I gotta get to the mountain and couldn't go up the cliff or anything. Whee! You are running a lot in this movie. Okay, so now he's in a cave inside the mountain. Why didn't you continue to climb on the surface? What about this cave makes you think that you'll still be able to get to the top through it? Seriously, why the fuck are you in here? I guess it makes it darker for dramatic effect for when the Ursa shows up. Ah! Oh shit, that was a close one. So bored. I wanna go to bed. Okay, so you're underwater inside the volcano. It's really convenient that you're still able to continue moving upwards. Oh shit, now I'm really scared. I thought this thing was supposed to be like super strong. Or maybe Katai's hands just have super strength. I'm sorry, Jaden, but the noises you make in this scene are fucking hilarious. <laughs> Well, now is as good a time as any to have a flashback. Again. Oh my god, that face is so fucking awkward. If I had walked in on this scene with no context, it would look like he's jerking off to the memory of his sister being murdered. Gotta lube up. Mmm, the Ursa. <laughs> oh, you sick fuck. Oh, it looks like the Ursa wants to join in. Oh wait, so I guess you can ghost now. And now the Ursa has no idea where you are. That's how you become not scared. You're lucky it can't smell anything else like your fucking blood or your sweat. What, you just didn't sweat this whole time? Nah, this nose is restricted to smelling fear pheromones only. What a quick and convenient solution to the problem at hand. Oh my god. Take that, my one and only means of defense. Just take it. Oh, I forgot it splits in half. Doesn't look too difficult to recover anyway, so whatever. <laughs> thought the gravity on this planet was stronger than what you were used to. So anyway, he kills the Ursa right before they're about to fall off a cliff. Yeah, I killed the Ursa just like my dad did when he saved humanity from extinction. Now all we gotta do is train everybody to ghost and fight like us and we'll destroy the Ursas and we'll be okay. Let's just forget that there was an entire alien race that created them to begin with. What happened to them? Are they still a threat? The whole movie's gone by and it seems like the script just fucking forgot about them. Shh, it's about father and son. Shh. So now the beacon actually works, yay! Some Randys show up and retrieve Will Smith. Oh my god, is my dad okay? Yeah, strobe effect. That only ever happens in really good movies. Stand me up. General. I said stand me up. Oh, do I sense some reincorporation? Aw, oh, he finally respects him. Aw, how emotional. Hmm. Mm. I want to work with mom. <laughs> Me too. Yay, we did it. Oh shit, there's whales at the end, cause Moby Dick. I love how M. Night's director's credit is the first thing to show up right after the film ends. Yep, that's the twist. Gotcha. Thanks, Dad. Now I'm sure to be a movie superstar. <laughs> shit. Yeah, just show this young little boy scampering.
flying around on the rocks for most of the show. So that's it. So I think it's fair to say that Will's plan didn't exactly work out the way he wanted it to. It seems as though people just weren't interested despite the ridiculous amount of promotion him and Jaden did for the film. <laughs> And apparently they didn't break even and there were expenses that I did not know about. Regardless, I do feel as though this was worse than The Last Airbender. Yes, The Last Airbender is a giant steaming pile of shit, and it definitely upset a lot more people because of the fan base. But every single fucking thing they did for this movie was a horrible idea. And to me, that spells out overconfidence. Like, pfft, yeah, Jaden will do fine. He's my son. Everybody will love him. Hey, Jaden looks really awkward when he runs. Let's have him run the whole movie. He's a young and developing actor who needs a lot of practice, let's have him try and tackle an accent that doesn't even fucking exist. If you've had nothing but success, then you might just forget that failure is even an option. This movie, After Earth, <laughs> yes. opened at number three, I which know. for you is this, you know, for yeah. most, most people are excited to be number three. It's been almost like two decades since I had a movie that wasn't you know, number one. Is that true? Yeah. Two decades of number one. Well, that's wow. over now, buddy. Thanks. <laughs> it was a mess. It was a tragedy. How did this movie even fucking happen? Oh, right. It was made for your son and not the audience. I forgot. You know, I just made the choice that uh, you growing and you uh, experiencing and remembering the experience of AE pleasantly was more important than getting the shot. Oddly enough, apparently parts of this film had striking similarities to Scientology. So if I even gave a shit about that, this review would be even longer. I never would have expected that a mere hour and 40 minutes of film fuck up would give me this much material to work with. But I almost feel as though I should have expected it from the living legend known as M. Night Shyamalan. And yeah, some of you may disagree and say that The Last Airbender is still worse than this. But regardless, if you guys are anything like me, you'll be preparing your fucking assholes for whatever horrendous monstrosity he releases next. Can you tell me anything about those two movies that you have written but haven't developed yet? Oh, I should I? I shouldn't tell you those. Well, one's a thriller and one's one's a romantic drama, actually. Those... Can you do the romantic drama first? Because there hasn't been a great romantic drama. By the way, while. everyone says that, and including my wife says that. Yeah. And and I I do really intend on doing it next okay. year. You know the cri the critics are. I don't know what's going on with me and the critics in the United States. I got to tell you. Um, you know I always had a European sensibility to my movies. So they the the pacing is always a light, little bit off for for them. You know, and it feels a little stilted, and they need more they need more electricity and all that stuff. And I'm like, this is the way I I think of things because you know, Hitchcock and Kurosawa and Stanley Kubrick. These are like the, my teachers. Knight is a very, very powerful artist who takes chances and goes hard at, you know, doing things that are different and, and unique. So there's going to be, you know, feast and famine with that. So I, I, in working with Knight, I've always loved his work and the ideas that he comes up with are as brilliant as anybody in the, the, the business. He, in, in his movies, he's never had a bad concept. I'm a stupid, 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 I'm a